Hello fellow project managers, business professionals. I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be talking about Agile. We're going to be talking about what it is and what it is not. So let's start off by addressing what Agile is. In a few words, you could say that Agile is a mindset. It's a state of mind. And the word mindset in this sense means an ever-evolving, ever-changing, ever-adaptable state of mind. I would call it more a state of mind at any point in time that enables you to pivot in response to the ever-changing world around us. That's what Agile is. It is not a framework. It is not a methodology, as many people wrongly say. In fact, I was querying these AI tools, ChatGPT and Bard, about Agile. And what I got back was it's a framework, or it's a methodology. And I said, uh, no, you got it wrong. It's not. Agile is a state of mind that is ever fluid, ever ready to be adaptive and malleable to the ever-changing world around. The world never stays stagnant. This field that I'm sitting in, it wasn't like this 50 years ago. It wasn't like this a hundred years ago, but it evolves, the world changes. And in order for you to be the best version of yourself from a humanistic point of view, you gotta be able to adapt. You gotta be able to keep up with the times and you gotta be able to mold your ideas in response to the ever-changing world around you. An example that I give very readily would be the likes of AI, right? The whole AI movement. That's a great example of adaptability. When people don't adapt, they resist change. You know, the same way people resisted the internet when it came out, or the same way people resisted TV and radio when it came out, the same way people are resisting AI. And that's not being agile. Being agile means you are able to respond to whatever change is, be it technology change, social change, economic change. And I'm talking about change that is for the better. It's moving forward, move with the time. Now, this whole idea about agile, it's been around for a while. It didn't start off in the 2000s. It's been a while, around for a while, back in the 80s, people were already talking about things like this. But it came to a head in 2001 when 17 people who had been used to doing things in a rather straight, linear fashion decided to explore ways of doing things differently. And this is what spurred what we know today as the Agile movement, if you will. The Agile movement was very well set on philosophies. You could call them values and principles that were established by what I would call a group of pioneers. And we're talking about 17 individuals who said, there's a better way, there's a better mousetrap of developing products. There's a better mousetrap for developing and working together. And that is the Agile Manifesto. So let's talk about the Agile Manifesto. It's a set of values and principles. And there are four values and 12 principles that I want to address. So let's address them one by one. The first value, it just states we're uncovering better ways of developing products 
by doing it and helping others do it. And through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So what does that mean? It means that as a business professional, as a team player, as a team member, when you look at the world around you and the people around you, value the individuals and how they interact over the processes and the tools. It's not saying processes and tools are not good because processes and tools establish a framework for us to do a lot of stuff. But being agile is all about valuing the people and how they interact over the processes and tools. Why is that? It's because people, they'll surprise you. You could have all the processes and tools in the world, but if people are not working together and collaborating and optimizing by synergizing, then those processes and tools aren't going to do very much for them. So we need to value people and their interactions over processes and tools. Another way of looking at it is like this. As an earthling, if someone from Mars, <laughs> assuming they could be, right? If someone from Mars appeared on planet Earth and asked you questions about planet Earth, you could say, through my being on planet Earth, I've come to value water over food because I know I'll survive longer if I have water than if I just had food. You get what I'm saying? That's not to say food is invaluable. It's just that you value water more for obvious reasons. So I want you, when you see over, I don't want you to think it's saying instead of. We're not saying water instead of food. No, we're saying individuals and interactions are valued, should be valued over the processes and tools. The next one says working product over comprehensive documentation. What are we saying here? We're saying that you should value a working product because without the product working, the manual does nothing for you. The manual is worthless. I give an example of how when I got a gift for Father's Day, which was a back massager, and I got all excited and I plugged in the back massager, but the back massager didn't come on. The back massager stayed off even though I had a big old manual. So I couldn't use, unfortunately, my back massager, neither could I use the manual. You see, working product is valued over comprehensive documentation. Because I had a working product, I would have been able to use the manual, but because I didn't have a working product, I couldn't. So the idea, my friend, is to value a working product and to drive to getting that product working over big old documentation, a stack of papers that tell you how to use a product that isn't working. You get what I'm saying? It's common sense. The next one is simply customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So what are we saying here? We're saying that it's better to have a mindset of collaboration with a customer than being so rigidly focused on contracts and this is what the contract says, so that's all we're doing, that's all we're giving. It's better to, in your mind, have a more collaborative response, a more collaborative ideology, as opposed to you just blindly looking at contracts and dollars and things like that. It's better for you to have more of a mindset to work with the customer, to help the customer as a servant, as it were, a leader, than for you to be so blinded to, oh, I have to go by the contract. This is what the contract says, and we can't do anything more than this. I always give this example of going to a Starbucks for my coffee, and I've gone there, let's say, for the past 10 years, and on this occasion, maybe there's a slip of tongue, and I get it wrong, and I say I want a three instead of a one, and they refuse to work with you. And they say, no, you said it's a three you wanted, and that's what you got. How rude would that be? <laughs> but in the same token, how rude is it when in the world of business, we don't allow the customer to work with us? 
because we don't want to work with them. You get what I'm saying? So when we talk about customer collaboration, work with a customer, you want to have branded on your t-shirt. Team customer. That's the mindset. All right, the next one simply says, responding to change over following the plan. And for this, I want to refer you to Mike Tyson, the great Mike Tyson, whether people like it or not, he's quite an interesting character. And he said, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. Think about it. You have a plan, you're in the ring, and bam, someone sucks you in the jaw, and you're on the canvas looking up. Think about that. You had a plan, but now where's your little plan? Your little plan can't save you. It's the same way in business. If you're not able to respond to change, you could be sucked in the jaw. A lot of people are responding to change in bad ways, saying, we're not going to do it. We're going to ignore that. Or that's not going to be around for long. Things are going to go back to normal. Uh, no. History has taught us many lessons. The like of Blockbuster, right? The likes of Blockbuster, the likes of Toys R Us, you know. I used to like Toys R Us, but they were not able to respond to the crazy e-commerce world. Amazon took them down, even, even though they were, Amazon was meant to be working with Toys R Us, but inadvertently or not, Amazon took Amazon took a bunch of people down. Those people that were not able to respond to change took them down. The whole toy industry had to bow down. Because e-commerce, you know, people, they just want to shop at home these days. Even the biggest chains, they respect Amazon because they know Amazon is a big kahuna. And they had to mimic. They had to copy, right? Or they had to get on the bandwagon of, of e-commerce. Look at the likes of TM Lewin, one of my favorite stores. They're not completely gone because someone bought their assets. But as a result of the crazy pandemic and them not being able to respond accordingly because they just had brick and mortar stores all around and people unable to go into those stores during the pandemic, it, it crushed them. But those who were savvy and had already built an e-commerce pipeline, they, they were able to survive. You know, or you look at the likes of Netflix who have dominated the space. And, you know, it's, it's funny because when Netflix began to absolutely kill it, the likes of HBO and Hulu and, you know, Peacock, all of them began getting on the bandwagon because they realized, oh, this is the way forward. And that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. you got to respond to change around you. I give it to Samsung. People, people criticize Samsung, but hey, they got a piece of the pie. They didn't respond late. They weren't tardy to the party, even though Apple was in the space. They jumped on the bandwagon and they started killing it. They start you know, releasing phone versions quicker than App Apple would ever because, you know, Apple, they're the design freaks, right? So whatever passes the Apple table, it, it has, it's so rigorous. And I, I give Apple full commendation for that. But Samsung, they were wild. They were beastly. They responded and, of course, they, their wrists got slapped. A few billions, perhaps, but they got a piece of the pie because they responded. They saw that the way forward was smartphones. Uh, how many people use flip phones? Go find out. Also, the likes of Kodak, right? Kodak, they've been around since, like, forever, you know? But when the tide changed and people went from instant photos with these big old manual cameras to phones... Kodak was behind. They were behind. They weren't able to catch up. Talk about bankruptcy, huh? And the tide changes. And all I'm saying is, in order to be agile, you must respond to the ever-changing world around you. You see, this is not about software. It's not about IT. A lot of people, they hear about agile and they begin to immediately shut us down, saying, oh, that's, that's just for IT. That's just software. Uh, no, no. Agile is not just about software. Agile is about a mindset, a response to change around you. It doesn't have to be software, even though it started there. It's funny because software, they've borrowed a lot from construction, right? From the world of 
operations and product, right? The Toyota factory and lean, yes. That's the origins of Agile. But we're getting it back. We engineers and construction people and product people and operations people, we're all jumping in to enjoy the benefits of Agile thinking, and we're doing it. And we're helping others do it. And through this work, we are coming to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working product over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. I hope you enjoyed this episode, my friends, of going through the Agile values. In my next video, I'm going to be working with you on understanding the Agile principles and their 12 principles if you want to stick around a little bit more you'll be able to watch this straight away so i'll be going into the values uh and the, going into the principles after the values and i hope you stick around if you're unable to stick around i'll see you in the next video all right for those of you who can stick around let's move on and talk about the principles to get to the principles, just scroll down on the Agile Manifesto.org page and click on the principles page, if it lets you. It doesn't seem to be letting me. There seems to be something going on. So I have to uh, get this set up to allow me to uh, share. So let me try that again, see if it will let me. I don't think it's going to let me. I thought I could. But if you stick around, we'll talk about the principles, all right? So just stick around. I'm going to talk about the principles. All right. So regarding the values, the values are more like overarching pillars that frame your thinking, that frame your direction of thought. But the principles... I refer to the principles as beacons of behavior. These are things that help frame how we actually behave. Because as a man thinker, so is he. So if you're thinking in a particular direction and your practices are guided by certain principles, well, you know for sure if you are truly being agile or not. There's a difference between being agile and doing agile. Some people say, oh, we're doing agile. We're implementing agile. No, you can't implement a mindset, my friends. You can implement frameworks and stuff, but when it comes to this whole world of agile, you gotta be honest. It's not something you can replicate and press a magic red button and bing, everybody's now agile. <laughs> That's not how it works. It's a mindset. You gotta, you gotta let the, the principles seep into you. And then when you are behaving, whichever way you are, you're able to gauge, oh, that was very unagile. Well, that was very agile. So let's dive into the principles now, okay? The first principle, it says we follow these principles. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable product. I always replace the word software with product because I want to respect all those who are not in the software space but espouse the agile principles, that espouse the agile dogma. Okay? So... When we say our highest priority, we mean it. That's why it's principle number one. If you are doggedly focused on satisfying your customer by delivering products and value and benefits early, you're in the right direction. This is where agile differs from predictive a little bit. In predictive, our major focus is not to deliver early and continuously. It's to deliver one time. But in the world of Agile, 
we want to deliver whatever we're delivering in tiny little chunks and increments as quickly as possible so that our customer can begin to reap the benefits, the harvest of us giving whatever value we are in tiny increments, in small increments. So our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. How? Through early and continuous delivery of valuable products. The key word being valuable, it's not just throwing anything at the customer and saying, there you go, there you go. No, it has to be valuable. Number two, welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Think about that. A lot of times when we get requests late in development, there's a tendency to complain and say, these customers, I can't believe they're asking for this at the 99th hour. But if only we had a change in mind, a change in heart to think about the fact that we wouldn't actually have a contract. Some of us wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for the customer. So when we think about the place of the customer, if they're asking for stuff late in development, we should actually say, this is for my customer's competitive business advantage. Why am I complaining? Why are we complaining? Let's do it. All right. So that makes sense. Number three, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to show the time scale. So in the world of Agile, one of the things we try to do is deliver frequently. And if we're delivering frequently, it means we're delivering in shorter iterations, shorter time bursts. And a predictive project could go on for a year, six months before seeing anything, even three months is long. But in an agile project, a lot of agile teams, they get stuff done four weeks or less. Some teams get stuff done in days and they're handing it off. Talk about the likes of Amazon and the whole AWS thing. They're delivering a lot frequently than just uh, weeks. They could be delivering in hours. They could be delivering in minutes. You think about Spotify. Spotify is always delivering on the regular. So when you think about the world of Agile, it's different from predictive in that we are delivering frequently and the time span is a lot quicker and we're doing it in short bursts and iterations and we are repeating over and over again. All right, next one says, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. If you're doing things in smaller increments, then there has to be daily frequent communication frequent collaboration. I remember training an architectural firm and one of the persons there on the call said, really daily? I don't like working with the sales team daily. They get on my nerves. I said, uh, that isn't really agile. <laughs> that is not an agile thought. Uh, let's find how we can enjoy working together. But beyond that, the reason why we work together daily in agile is we have different roles in some of these frameworks. And in one of the frameworks, there's a role that's from the business called a product owner. And the product owner is just one of the team working with the developer and working with a coach who we call the scrum master, the coach who coaches the team to be able to get things done expediently and efficiently. And we work together daily. And that's the idea. We're working as a team. We're together. We're team customer. We're all one. That's the idea. All right, let's move on. Build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. How would you like to work with a demotivated team? Build a project around a demotivated team. Oh, I hate coming into work. Oh, that fly did show up for work. <laughs> I hate coming into work. I cannot stand the surroundings I'm in. No, that's not good. We want to build our projects around a team that enjoys coming into work, a team that is enjoying the environment that they're in because we give them the environment and support they need. We trust them to get the job done and we're not babysitting them. We're not bubble wrapping them. They're allowed to make mistakes. They correct. They get on the paddy wagon and they do better. And, and that's, that's the general idea. The next one says the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. This is not rocket science. It's been proven over and over again and the likes of Professor Emeritus Abba Moravian, they've done research and part of his research was about communicating a heartfelt, empathetic message, high stakes kind of message. When you're communicating those kind of messages, the body language, the tone of voice is huge. It's really accentuated in that 
in his experiments, he found a 55-38-7 configuration. 55% of the communication was perceived or came across strongly by the body language. 38% through the tone of voice and only 7% of the message was perceived through the words. And you can go read up the experiment, Professor Emeritus Albert Moravian, and it's truly remarkable research. We're not saying every communication follows this cookie cutter, but we're saying as a rule of thumb, action speaks louder than words. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I think you, I think you did a good job. That doesn't speak the language because the body language is off. There needs to be congruence, right, between what you say, how you say it, and your stance, right, your body language. So the 55387, it holds true, and that's why we say when you have an opportunity of communicating, face-to-face -face is the best. There's some things you communicate as a team, the fireflies have come out to play. There's some things that you communicate within a team, and it just goes better when it's face-to-face. -face. Empathy is felt, understanding is felt, sincerity is felt, and sometimes it even has nothing to do with that. It's about tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. It's about being in that same location, the proximity. It just helps convey whatever message it is, whatever the communication is. So that's all we're saying here. All right, let's move on. Next one says, working product is a primary measure of progress. So when we do things in the world of Agile, we endeavor to do things in short bursts. And for that reason, our primary measure of progress is not some Gantt chart. It's not a Gantt chart. It's not um, some big old histogram. Um, our primary measure of progress is a working product in the world of Agile. So if you're done, you're done. We give you a two-week window, three-week, four-week, whatever that window is. It's short. But the summary is you either have a working product at the end of the two-week window or whatever the window is, or you don't. If you do have something, hooray, great, that's progress. If you don't, well, the primary measure of progress says uh, you got ways to go. All right, so that's how you need to think about it. The next one says agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace. These flies are maintain a constant pace, maintain a constant pace indefinitely. So what this is telling you is don't kill the team. I call it the don't kill the team principle. What it's saying is work at a pace that you know you can sustain for the long haul. If you are working 80 hour weeks, you're living in la la land because you, that is not sustainable. Someone says, no, it's sustainable for me. Well, whatever's sustainable for you, my friend, but in reality, don't do what is going to kill the team, what is going to burn them out. Someone says, well, just do a bunch of overtime. Well, overtime isn't our friend. It's not our best friend in this world of Agile for a number of reasons. First of all, overtime is not repeatable. So it messes with your metrics and whatever empirical measurements you want to glean. It's not sustainable. So as much as possible, we want reality for the sake of empiricism and because we don't want to kill the team. All right, so that's what we're saying there. Let's move to the next one. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Agility originates from the idea of being lean. You want to do the minimum to get the maximum. So when you pay attention to technical excellence and good design, it prevents waste. I'm not saying it avoids waste, but it definitely prevents a whole lot of fan clean, a whole lot of waste. And that's why you should be technically excellent. Don't do a shoddy job. Don't do shoddy work. We don't want technical debt, which is, you know, owing things to be done the right way because we cut corners. The fan is still spinning, but under the fan, we've got a mass of wires and cables that are all over the place. To service that thing is going to be hard. Well, that's not agile and that's not technical excellence. Technical excellence is following the design principles, getting it right, have solid design. You know, the, the great Steve Jobs, he said design is not just what it looks like, well, what it feels like. Design is how it works. You know, so in order to get a good product, spend time in great design. All right, the next one says, 
Simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, is essential. What is it saying? It is saying maximize the amount of fat you cut out. Cut out the fat. In a lot of processes today, if we look under the hood, we find things that are not even worth doing. Things that we shouldn't even be really focusing on. And those things that we see that are fat, we need to cut it out and we need to maximize the amount of fat that we cut out. So maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. All right, it's coming down to the wire here, my friend. We've got two left. This says, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. It's been proven. When you give the team the environment and support they need, trust them to get the job done, let them figure it out, they get the best results. The final one here just says, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjust its behavior accordingly. What we're saying here is that the idea of a retrospective is a good idea. Retrospectives are a, uh, you could call them an event in Agile where the team looks in the rear view mirror at what went well, what didn't go so well, what could we do better? What did we do that we want to repeat? And it's a reflection, it's them reflecting on what happened and making sure that things go well. Uh, beyond the point they're in. You could call it Kaizen. So there you have it, my friends. We took a look at the four values and the 12 principles of Agile. And I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, share with your friends, and you'll meet me again. That's for sure. I'll be back talking about Agile some more. All right? You take care. Remember, go on down to agilemanifesto.org, and uh, you can actually download a version of this. I'll endeavor to put a link below. You take care and bye for now.